Hi everyone, Suzanne Clemens here, one of the pastors at Trinity United Methodist Church in Lafayette, Indiana. And for the past few weeks, we have been um, exploring together a challenge that has been um, passed down to us to cultivate to joy. So we've been encouraged to ask, you know, what would it look like for us at Trinity to intentionally cultivate joy here um, in our congregation, in our community, in our families, in each of our own hearts? And today, as we wrap up this sermon series, I want to reflect on, uh, one, what we've already heard and pondered about cultivating joy. And then I want to lead us into a concluding meditation on joy. So first, what have we pondered so far? Well, our previous messages have um, lifted the following about joy. First, we established together that God is joy that joy is God's essence, and that God wants us to live lives of joy, and that the secret to this is living, living lives of deep meaning. Joy is not a surface or fleeting happiness. It's deeper than that, and we can't ma manufacture it ourselves. It's a byproduct of God's Spirit working within us. And God is the source of our joy, and when we stay connected to that source, like branches staying connected to the true vine, we will experience joy. And it takes effort to do this. So we have to keep coming back, meaning that we have to stay connected to God and with our community to have joy. We aren't responsible for others' joy, or really even our own, because that's God's job. We won't always feel happy and life will be hard, and that's okay. And that doesn't have to steal our joy. And finally, our joy is wrapped up in the hope that we have in God's goodness and God's promises. Our joy can look like the anticipation of God's action in our lives and in the world because we have a deep faith that God will provide for us. And we trust that peace, hope, love, and joy will ultimately be our reality. Well, I think that these are already pretty good reasons for us to want, as a church family, to be a community and a place where we cultivate joy. And as we conclude our series of meditations today, I want to move us a step further um, into the joy that is ours as mature companions on the journey with God. Because when we stay connected with God, when we keep coming back, when our deepest desire is to do God's will, and when our lives start to look more and more like Jesus, we can explore and we can see what joy might look like for us. Well, our gospel story for today gives us a place to imagine the ripened cultivation of joy. Um, I love the story of the wedding at Cana. Um, this is the place where Jesus turned water to wine because we can see joy operating on so many different levels in this story. So here we have Jesus performing his first public miracle in the Gospel of John at a wedding feast, celebrating with the disciples and with his mother. He's at a party, right? And in a recent message, I shared about my time in France where the villages in summer had week-long parties. Well, in Jesus' time, wedding feasts could last up to a week. And Jesus is out with the people. He's having a good time. Throughout scripture, we see that Jesus often scandalizes his religious contemporaries, especially the Pharisees, because he dines with people, including people of ill repute. He enjoys life among the people. He even permits lavish gestures. Like there's a story when a woman pours expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and she kisses them, and she dries her tears on his feet with her hair. And uh, this again is a time when the, when the people around Jesus are pretty scandalized. So, so we have this portrait of Jesus as someone who enjoys life. <clears throat> and we also honor God when we enjoy the good things that life offers us, when we live life to the fullest, when we make time to go to the party and experience the joy that such occasions offer us. Well, there's another way that the wedding at Cana 
shows us how Jesus experienced joy. And from this point on, my reading of this gospel text is going to be informed by a Father Ron Rollheiser, who also reminds us that in the Gospel of John, the, the text often carries at least two meanings. Um, there is a, a literal meaning of the story as it's described, and then there's usually a deeper meaning there that we're to listen to. And he points out, too, that this story is as much about Jesus' mother Mary as it is about Jesus. Because she's the one who notices first that the wedding hosts have run out of wine. She sees this and she calls out to Jesus and she says, look, they have no wine. And given that this wedding feast was likely intended to last several days, this is a big concern. Um, wine was central to the celebration. Now we're told there were several jugs of water around but these were used for washing and purification. And back then, uh, people just couldn't choose to drink the water. Um, and whatever the reason for the shortage of wine, uh, this probably reflects poorly on the wedding hosts because it's gonna prevent the celebration of new life through marriage to continue. So Mary here is giving voice to human need. She speaks from a place of compassion. And how does Jesus respond? Well, I'll admit to you all, I've always been um, puzzled by this part of the text, but Rollheiser gives me a way to understand it. Because Jesus says, when Mary says, look, there, there is no wine, Jesus says, well, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Well. Jesus is our for what? Is this about his hour to do miracles? Um, as, is, as if he and the Heavenly Father have a kind of arrangement and Jesus can't perform miracles yet? Well, I don't, I don't think that's it because we know too that in Scripture, overall as we, as we read Scripture, we know that when, we, when, when there is talk of Jesus' hour, that this refers to the hour of his passion, the hour of his surrender the hour of his death on the cross. And well, what does this have to do with the wedding at Cana, which is, which is a celebration? Well, Jesus initially begs off responding to the human need expressed here, but Mary's persistent in her compassion, and she tells the people around her to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. And Jesus joins Mary in her compassion, and he responds by meeting the need, and he turns the water into wine. Well, Rollheiser asks, what brings wine into a room? Meaning, what brings life into a room? Throughout scripture, wine is a symbol for life, for vitality, for blessing, for joy. So we could ask, who are the ones who bring life into any space, whether it's a party, a home, a church, a workplace, well, the ones who bring life are the ones who are willing to put their lives down. The ones who are willing to sacrifice their personal interests. The ones who are willing to respond to the cries of human need that they hear. The ones who bring life are the ones who hear and act with compassion. The one who give of themselves to meet the needs of others. The ones who do whatever is needed to bring help, vitality, to respond to human need and limitation. And ultimately, this is what Jesus does for all of us, isn't it? He shows us how to give our lives for others. So Rollheiser goes on to ask, are we today doing what is necessary for each other? Are we bringing wine into the room? Or are we at times so focused on our own needs and drawing a, a line around ourselves, right, to protect what's ours, making sure that we're okay, keeping ourselves distance of, distant from those whose vulnerability and limitations make us uncomfortable? Well, to love as Jesus loved, we must hear and respond to the needs of each other. And this means being present to one another and carrying each other's burdens. We're called to be compassionate 
in the way that Mary and Jesus are compassionate. We are also called to be the ones who turn water into wine. And I'll acknowledge this can be hard for us to do. You know, it's especially hard when we feel it's just up to us alone to respond to the human need around us. It can feel overwhelming, can it? And Rollheiser acknowledges, you know, he says, how many of us watch the news and find ourselves despairing? Because it's depressing, isn't it? He says that if we watch the news alone, we really will become discouraged. But what would it mean for a congregation gathered together to watch the news together? Maybe together we could do something about the needs that we see. And better yet, what if churches or communities come together? Um, These folks together really could make a difference, couldn't they? Um, And I want to remind all of you that this is exactly why our connection to our local community partners and our Indiana conference and our global conference is so important. Because when we work together and, and, and give together to meet human need, we can make a significant difference. We can make change happen. And what if all over the world, right, we listened together and we responded together, we could change the world. And as Pastor Lori a couple of weeks ago reminded us, we have to keep coming back, connected to our God, coming back together so that we can be the church together. Being compassionate isn't just a feeling that we have, it's action that we take. And for those following the way of Jesus, it will gradually become the rhythm of our lives if we are growing and being transformed into the way of Jesus. And Rollheiser reminds us again that the first thing that Jesus did in public ministry was to form a group. Jesus did not turn water to wine alone. He did it within a community of others. And God wants us to experience joy like Jesus and Mary, the joy that comes from the deep meaning that's ours when we hear with compassion the needs around us and give radically and generously of ourselves for others. Well, I want to share about an opportunity that I had just this week to experience this kind of joy. And it's thanks to our uh, church family at Trinity Uh, that gives to our caring fund. A young woman in our community with a one-year-old son reached out to us for assistance with her rent. Um, She's recently uh, separated from her partner and uh, a few weeks ago he intentionally crashed into her car and her vehicle was totaled and she lost her way to get to work. Um, So she ended up losing that job. Um, and she was transferred to Trinity by an agency she received support through in our community. Well, when by the time I spoke with her, she had already found a new job that she can get to without a car, but she wasn't able to start until this past week. Um, but during that time, she also had to keep taking her son to daycare and paying for that, or else she was going to lose her daycare. And if she lost her daycare, well, then she wasn't going to be able to continue to work. So she was really in a bind. And through the generosity and compassion of Trinity, we were able to cover um, most of that amount, the amount that she needed for rent. And this was one of those instances where I determined that we could assist with a large amount of that uh, that she needed because I knew that this would definitely give this young mother what she needed and that with our support, her needs could be fully met, that we could alleviate her suffering and give her the security and peace of mind that she needed. And this week she reached out to me with this message that I want to share with all of you. She wrote to me, good evening. I have had a long day. Every day isn't easy. I take things day by day, but this specific morning I woke up in a really great mood to get ready to walk to work. And I didn't even check my phone, which isn't normal. Got all the way to work and noticed when I did look that a blessing was given to me right before my eyes. 
and I've been very stressed for three weeks. Just a 24-year-old first-time mom trying to keep my head above water for my one-year-old. I've been thinking of what can be done and how I can do it within two weeks. Needless to say, as long as God sees you trying, he will do the rest. What good help is to me is a person seeing someone's situation from every angle and going above and beyond to help that person or family the best way possible. And that's very rare to find. Helping someone in need may not always be easy, but the great feeling you get in your heart makes you want to save the world. This church took the biggest weight off my shoulder and showed to me that my God is real and on time. God bless and thanks again for what you've done for me and my son. Well, friends, I do not believe there is a greater joy than what grows in your heart when you go over and beyond to respond to human need. And you all feel that too, don't you? And the closer you are to the person in need, to their situation, the more joy you will have. It is not enough to be compassionate from a distance. Real compassion requires entering the space with another, getting down in the trenches with them. And this is messy and hard. And I'll be honest with you all, it's not usually as simple and easy as the situation I have just described to you. And I am inviting you to grow in this with me. If you're here at Trinity, as your associate pastor, there is but so much that I can do alone. And think of how we, as a church community, might truly be able to change some things and be part of life-generating efforts in our community if we work together. So take this as my direct invitation to each of you listening to listen with the ear of your heart. And if you feel God nudging you to step out of your comfort zone and grow in compassion and service, if you have the gift of time and presence to give to others, would you please reach out to me? Or if you are at a distance, you reach out to others where you are. I don't know exactly what this might look like for us together, but I have no doubt that when we join together from a place of compassion and generosity, and when we know that it is God's strength and wisdom and love working through us, it's His grace that touches the lives of others. And when we stay connected to that vine, we too can change water into wine. Thanks be to God. <laughs>